Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your patience in holding. We now have your presenters in conference. Please be aware that each of your lines is in a listen-only mode. You may submit questions or comments at any time using the chat box located to the right of your slideshow. You may also download a copy of the presentation by using the files pod located above the chat. It is now my pleasure to introduce today's first presenter, Mr. Chris Hund. Thanks, David. Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. Welcome to the July edition of the uh, monthly National Implementation of Team Steps webinars. Today we're going to be uh, listening to a webinar, uh, Strategies for Preparing for Team Steps Implementation in the Clinical and Educational Settings. So welcome. Uh, and my name is Chris Hund, as David mentioned, uh, Director for Clinical Quality with the American Hospital Association. Uh, with the, the Health Research and Educational Trust. So we're, we're your hosts for today. Just a couple rules of engagement before we get going here. Uh, you can listen to the audio for this webinar in two ways. You can listen through your phone. If you do listen through your phone, make sure to mute your computer speakers because you'll get some uh, feedback and it will sound very strange. So mute those computer speakers. Or if you're not listening through your phone, you could, of course, listen just through your computer. There's going to be a Q&A session that we're going to have at the end of the presentation. If you have any questions while the presentation is going on, drop them in that chat box that you see on the right-hand side. If it's a question that's more logistical in nature or uh, something that's easily answered, we'll answer it as the presentation is going along. If it's more content-based, what we do is we gather all of those and try to put together a coherent Q&A that tries to follow some thematic threads. So that's what we'll be doing uh, at the end. So as you go, chat your questions in, and it kind of helps us put together a nice Q&A for the end of the presentation. Uh, just a couple things on some upcoming Team Steps events. We have monthly webinars scheduled through August of 2016. We also, there's an online course that you can sign up for, and then the link is right there, the registration link for it. Uh, right now, all of the Team Steps courses are filled up through September, but there'll definitely be more Team Steps courses offered in the future, uh, so keep your eye open for that. They'll likely start taking place again in the wintertime. Um, a special thank you to the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, who funds this Team Steps work uh, and is able to uh, help us here at HRET to provide these types of events for you. If you ever have any help with or need any help with Team Steps, we have a dedicated helpline. The phone number is listed there, as well as a dedicated email address. And so that's a great place to ask any sort of questions be them how to, you know, go to a course or download a recorded copy of this webinar to how do you do something when you're implementing or who can I speak to about coaching. So that's a great place to get in touch with us. All right, I promised I'd be brief, and I was. And I'm going to now do a very quick introduction for our presenters today, and then they're going to say a few words about themselves before we get going. So we're really lucky to have two folks today. Uh, one is Charles Crescioni. He's Senior Quality Improvement Specialist, uh, also with a nursing background, and he's uh, with the University of Florida Health. We also have Dr. Amy Blue, and she's Associate Dean for Educational Affairs at the University of Florida College of Public Health and Health Professions, and she's also the Associate VP for Interprofessional Education in the U University of Florida, Florida Health Office, as well as the Senior Vice President for Health Affairs. So they're both coming to you from Florida, uh, where I'm sure it's very warm, hot and humid today, but that's the way it is around the rest of the country too, it seems. So for one of those rare times in the year, we're all kind of experiencing the same weather. Um, all right, so I'm happy now to turn it over to both of you, Charles and Amy. 
Well, thank you very much for letting us uh, join you all today. We're very excited to hear from you all, Dr. Blue and I. Um, and as you said, I'm a work with, for the University of Florida Health System. I have a academic background in nursing and uh, industrial engineering, and I've been around the block a few times in a variety of clinical jobs and leadership uh, over the years. And of course, I'm joined by one of our faculty from the, the, the Health Science Center faculty, Dr. Right. Amy Blue. Amy, thanks, Charles, and, and thanks for the introduction and the opportunity to share our story with you folks today. Um, just in real brief, as you see, I have a dual role here. My um, area of expertise is really interprofessional education. I've been involved with it for over 10 years and have been at the University of Florida for about three years now. I'll share some of that within my story, but we're excited to share what we've been doing with everybody. Great. Thank you again for having us. So. Um, uh, our objectives today, uh, we're, we're going to describe the common and unique strategies that we're working through and the resources required for implementing team steps in both the clinical and educational settings. Uh, we're going to share key components of effective planning regarding buy-in, resources, and measuring effectiveness that we're also working through. And then we'll go share the status of our own efforts and plan next steps. <clears throat> um, just a Quick demographics, I won't go in great detail, but just know we are a fairly large academic medical center in Gainesville, Florida. We've got about 1,000 beds and almost 1,000 uh, faculty physicians. Our physicians are faculty of the College of Medicine here. Uh, we're, we're, we'll, um, the, we're bringing up two new hospitals uh, on campus as we speak. We uh, help a neuroscience um, hospital and a cardiovascular hospital are they're top, they topped out recently on our campus, and we should be opening them uh, next year. Um, let's see, the, the colleges of the university were extremely blessed to have these six colleges immediately adjacent to the hospital. We all can literally eat lunch in the same restaurants. They're right between the two places. And uh, as uh, we, we see here, we've got between six and 7,000 students in the Health Science Center with over $300 million in research awards. So they, we are all on the campus of the University of Florida. Uh, so, you know, the obvious question, why, why team steps? So um, about a year ago, uh, I think we, we both slightly independently and then we connected up shortly thereafter. We're, we're looking for something. We're a very large and growing organization. Obviously, we've been focused uh, for some time on high reliability. It's in pretty much a lot of what we do. I'll talk to you about our strategic plan. In a little bit, we have you know a large number of process improvement initiatives in place and building, like I'm sure all of you do. Um, but the, the, one of the things, the uh, commonalities, is we do find opportunities in teamwork and communication. So we're looking for the potentials for an enterprise level framework for optimization and something to leverage the things we're already working on and measuring. So toward that end. Um, with the, any, pre, any implementation review or an overview of what we're talking about would have to include optimizing, obviously, the resources we have, which are considerable, uh, and the, our own culture and history here, both with the, uh, the colleges of the Health Science Center and uh, the Academic Medical Center. Uh, we, we, it, interestingly enough, as I talked to you about the two towers going up on our campus, it's, we walk by them every day, and uh, you, you get that sense as you watch it go up the sense of building uh, a strong foundation before you go up. So this particular building, the way they're building it, they're very particular with the way the beams are, and then all of a sudden a new floor appears. So they, you know, it's just that that floor doesn't appear until the beams. The beams take longer than the floor. So it's just it's that constant uh, allusion uh, for us. And then uh, obviously the connections we have to seek ongoing consensus between the colleges and the hospital, which we're both going to touch on, but that's uh, paramount in what we're both trying to do to achieve that end for our, uh, in our, uh, not only healing, but our teaching mission here at the University of Florida. Um, <clears throat> touching on that enterprise level plan, so obviously a very large organization as ours, we wanted to actually take a long view in a way of optimizing uh, the spread. So we, we are on five-year strategic plans here, interestingly, interestingly enough, excuse me, our current plan for 2015 to 2020 is the power of together. It is as follows our previous plan, which was forward together. So both of these plans are replete with uh, those emphasis on communication, uh, uh, you know, the and optimizing the resources we have for you know whatever they may be in personnel, technology, uh, etc. Um, for our purposes here, with a lot of standing. 
uh, venues and broadcast media, our initial plan was let's utilize all of that as best we can, and we sort of repeatedly dose the information. If there are meetings that fo are facing, focusing on safety, uh, that's, that's a natural place for us. So uh, Dr. Blue and I have gone to various ones in our own respective worlds and together within our, uh, in, in the venues that bring us together. Often there are College of Medicine faculty meetings that bring in the operational leaders. Also, so we do have the opportunity, some of our meetings uh, types of venues are broadcast system-wide and archived. So we took advantage of that. Um, and again, it goes go back, you know, repeated just, you know, because here overall it's been, it's a voluntary um, look at this right now. In other words, we seek out um, people who want to, you know, join with us and kind of kick the tires and look at this. Um, so to evaluate ongoing how it would fit in their organization. I'll talk about a timeline in just a little bit. But one of the things we have to do here is, you know, discern and acknowledge our barriers. Our organization, it, it, it's, it's very large, and its work units tend to be very large. That brings in a level of self-reliance that I hadn't experienced in other lives. So these work units, be they medical services or nursing units, they often have a lot of resources of their own, so they're relatively self-sufficient. So often it's the, when these services are coming together for patient care or operational things, that's often where we find opportunities in the workflows uh, and their own individual cultures uh, for the, that, that connection. Um, the, uh, I, I love the picture, the old civil engineering joke of the bridge that's built from both sides. That's beautiful and it's perfect on both sides, but it doesn't quite meet in the middle. I think this is where we often see the opportunity uh, for our workflows that the, it may work. One service may have one, another service has another. They're relatively satisfied with what's going on, but when they meet, there's not always that good meeting of the workflows and it creates uh, maybe additional resource needs that it shouldn't. Um, we have our own, obviously, a long institutional memory of initiatives and what has gone well and what hasn't. Um, we do have many that go well and some that don't spread. So we've been looked at that very carefully. Again, we want to, right now, we're keeping this more voluntary, and I'll talk to you a little bit more about what we've done. Obviously, we're always looking at the human aspects of uh, handling change. Dr. Blue is an educator, um, you know, in the health professions and my own background in engineering. It's all about, you know, um, the humans and, and what, what do they need in all of this and what do we want to uh, communicate to them and how can we handle that in looking at the history of uh, change initiatives and what uh, we've been satisfied with. And uh, tying this all together, what we often find here is we're not, the, a standing start sometimes is actually easier than the switching gears we're kind of asking them to do. These, the, often when we're we talk to a department or a service line, they have something already in the veins of team steps, you know, our, and, and it's like, well, why do you want me? I've got that. And even when you look at the pieces and the parts that, say, the falls reduction plans that institutions have done utilizing team steps, you can look at that and you go, well, we do all that. Well, yes, yeah, we do, but there might be a better way to link them and connect them. So that's often, it, it, it kind of like, they, they don't, it's just you have to be able to look at it a little deeper is all. Obviously, we can't do anything without the support of our, of our leadership. Uh, we've been given, you know, a, a, even each other as resources and abundant resources. We're, we try and be good stewards of that. Their expectations of us are, you know, that we constantly touch back base with them and that they know uh, what's going to look at where the strategic planning comes in and what they may want to, uh, how they may want to step in at various times for uh, resource utilization. And I cannot go any further by talking about we are very blessed in our organization, we have a framework between our, our neurosurgical and neurology uh, service lines whereby the faculty, the inpatient units, and uh, much of their infrastructure are very much aligned. And we have a NICAP, which is the Neuromedicine Interdisciplinary Clinical and Academic Program. So they actually, as I mentioned, one of the two new towers that are going up is their future hospital. Everything will be brought over there, including their clinics. Uh, the other one, again, is the cardiovascular group. This group committed to Team Steps well over a year ago, uh, lock, stock, and barrel. They are going to be Team Steps through their inpatient units, uh, their clinics, their faculty, uh, it, it, the whole thing. So when we made those initial uh, trips uh, last year out to Denver in June of last year, uh, their quality uh, leader, Dr. Uh, Baron Lee, was one of us that went out there to get the training with Dr. Baker 
uh, there, and they have just been leading the way uh, all along with a full, just a full service program to show us. So actually, we start fundamentals training. Our first fundamentals training here will be next month, starting with them. They are closing their clinics, and then the inpatient units will uh, obviously, you know, stagger over some, you know, period of time to get everybody through. So we really feel strongly that that is going to bring together people who know we've been doing this, but that'll be that if you look to the bottom right of your slide, uh, nowadays when you're going to do a project, you can consult with YouTube, and we've been very much happy with the, um, the Dancing Man video. So the nightcap for us is a leader and or a first follower, however you want to look at it, but it's, it's, it's great power uh, for us. Um, Obviously, uh, our respective worlds, and I say that we are all on one campus, but the, obviously there's some different thinking. We'll have some bifurcation in our implementation. So we wanted an initial inoculation overall of the entire Health Science Center, and to that end we wanted to bring in a subject matter, and that's where Dr. Baker graciously agreed to come, and likewise he uh, invited Dr. Kevin Crane from Tulane to come, and they did a, a first an hour webinar just for us, from their respective locations. We have we recorded that and have archived it and I included in most of my communications about Team Steps where they gave us that early view. I had teed that up a little bit before in one of our other venues telling everybody they were our quality grand mounds venue that they were coming and that uh, a little bit of what Team Steps was. Um, operationalizing this likewise our, uh, Dr. Blue and I both come from offices within these worlds at a very broad function. I'm in the health science center, the, excuse me, the quality center here. So we have, we're, we have get great entrance into a lot of venues. We cross the entire health science center. Uh, we report to the chief quality officer who the colleges and likewise the hospital uh, uh, report, in, re report into her. Uh, Dr. Blue in the office of interprofessional education and she'll give us some more detail. Obviously, she gets, has connection with all of the academic programs in the Health Science Center. So that's been a win-win uh, for the two of us. Toward that end, the hospital, obviously, day-to-day -day care operations are the priority. So, uh, you know, we're, we're looking at a multi-year approach. Uh, we're going to take our time, uh, get, get this right. Um, and we're, so one of the things we've done in talking about the beams is, and the you know, the leaders and the first followers is to build a cadre of master trainers and coaches across the organization. So we've trained uh, about 100 uh, so far. Uh, we, we definitely engaged uh, physicians, I think about a quarter of that or a third are physicians. And likewise, the physicians, we've asked them to be our instructors along with us in these uh, classes. Um, you know, they're the, the physicians, they're not hospital employees, they're College of Medicine faculty. I know out, out in the world there's a variety of models, but typically the physicians are not uh, hospital employees. So there's, there may be some challenges there, that linkage and how do you bring them together. And obviously physicians have, you know, a lot of influence. Uh, I heard it so well in a Vizient production recently, the double influence, that the, the sharp end and the blunt end, and then the infrastructure, um, of, you know, the care and the orders and a variety and then the actual hands-on care themselves. So we have been very uh, grateful to have our faculty, um, some of our faculty early leaders want to jump in and teach Team Steps. And I can tell you the physicians get a, they really enjoy that as well, to hear their colleagues who run clinics and run large services, um, you know, tell them how they see it and what their, you know, some initial things they're doing to prepare for this. Um, just the, the colleges. Uh, again, Dr. Blue will talk to us a little bit about that. The realization could be necessarily shorter. Uh, once the faculty have engaged, uh, you know, the, they have latitude over the curriculum, and you have a captive audience, and the academic year is their currency and, uh, and their turnaround time. So it's, we just have to acknowledge those differences as they work through the, the – have, but she'll tell you what they've done as we prepare for those graduates to come. The slide you're looking at now is not on template. This is a slide – uh, that uh, is usually my beginning slide for presentations here. The power of together in the middle, this is the logo for our strategic plan. I included some pictures of the towers at their earliest levels going up. Um, uh, I'll show you a picture of where they are now later. But the, you know, the U.S. health strategic plan is all about building high reliability in a culture of safety. I mean, it's throughout the document. And then, so uh, put at the bottom of that, the enterprise framework for 
the shared mental model, and a functionally integrated team. This is what my senior leaders, uh, regardless of team steps, but this is what they say, this is in the strategic plan, this is where we're going, and this. So it just seems like, and we're showing how team steps could be a natural, a natural fit for this. So with that, um, so ha the alignment with hospital operations is obviously the, the big sell here. So one of the things, um, the premise that I try and uh, interject whenever I can, and, and, I, and I got this from the AHRQ uh, you know, presentations I've looked at, is Team Steps is not a new program. I bring that up because when you're talking to people, they're like, Team Steps, I think I've heard of that. You know, I'm already doing so much. I don't know if I have the time. When do you want to do that? I'm like, no, 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 no. This is not new. This is optimizing everything you're already doing. This underlies what you do. So, and, and this is, you know, to make the cusp work better and a variety of other things. Interestingly enough, we're already a big uh, believers in the AHRQ uh, status of patient safety survey. We use it and HCAPs. We use these to drive what we're doing now. So there's a win-win with, with measurement and we can look at what other facilities have done and the history of the sanctioning by AHRQ and Department of Defense. This is powerful here. I mean, when you start talking about this, people pay attention, um, you know, and, and it's that, that hook just to get you to, to hear what I'm saying with that because sometimes they think they know what Team Steps is, but uh, they may not. We, we emphasize the safety deliverables because that's what we're, particularly what the expectations of us in the Quality Center. And I like to usually establish the big win, the history within air travel, and even the delays of air, the airline industry to take on things. that, And it's kind of like where we are. Some of them may be, how do you get this prevalent in your industry? Uh, well, I'd like to, I borrow much from the Team Steps website and look for deliverables, cases, patterns, and results from other institutions. So, um, and then, last but not least in this, we have a large strategic plan, but all of us have plans for provision of care throughout our organization. I mean, out of necessity or, you know, regulation or whatever. If you look at them, they're great blueprints for where you've already said you want to go. And then I try and nest where team steps can fit into this uh, based on the curriculum and then the history. So that, that usually gets people very interested. Again, we talked about dosing it. We present it broadly and repeatedly. Uh, we have a lot of established safety venues. And... Then there's targeted venues. So, for instance, our congenital heart center, you know, the leadership team received uh, myself and uh, uh, one of my interns recently. So we went up. I sort of targeted the presentation with them, and I took some deliverables from other institutions in pediatric intensive care units and NICUs and other presentations. And it makes it more interesting for them just when you talk about ventilator days or paralytic days, but we can show them. But, you know, this is a pediatric intensive care unit. Uh, and so, so that it's all, you know, and then they're sending people to our next, our next training from that, from that leadership team. Um, just, I've kind of talked through this timeline, but just in general, we, you know, in June, we, we went out for training. Dr. Blue and I engaged with each other in August, and it was just like a win-win, like manna from heaven for us, because the colleges were sometimes a bit of a mystery. Um, and then uh, we, you know, Dr. Baker came, and Dr. Crane did a, pro a production for us in October. Then both Dr. Baker and Dr. Crane came in December to meet with our leaders in some intimate meetings and some more broader venues. I can tell you that the leaders were very impressed, and um, it, uh, it, it, that, that helped us a lot with that going forward. You know, they want us to continue working on this, and they trained 40 master trainers for us uh, while they were here, and Dr. Blue and I have taken on that baton in February uh, and April, again, our next training um, uh, is coming up. We're doing next master training next month, but the fundamentals begin with our, our NICAP. And again, I know I've said it, but we're so very excited because that is really going to generate the buzz across the Health Science Center when you have a whole service line like neurosurgery and neuro, neurology doing this. Everybody's going to know what they're doing, want to know what they're doing and where they're going. So um, on that note, and if you notice these pictures from the, the Dancing Man uh, video, I mean, we, we, it's really powerful for us, the, first, the whole concept of the first follower, the group, et cetera. Um, on that note, I'd like to turn it over Great. to Amy, and she's going to take us through the colleges. Great. Thanks, Charles. And um, I'll have to confess, he has the tougher job in all of this because he's working with this huge and, and a very established and excellent healthcare system, but for those of you who are engaged in organization on cultural change, you all appreciate how hard that is to do within a complex organization <coughs> like that. 
Again, I represent, we'll just sort of say, the, the academic and the colleges. And just a, a brief reiteration, UF, obviously, it's a huge um, college campus. But we are really fortunate to have what's the six, what's considerably uh, considered the six traditional health professions here. And we are all very physically close together. As Terrell said earlier, we could have lunch. And we do have lunch together with um, our colleagues with the colleges. I wanted to start out as I want to share how I got to the point where I met Charles. And then I'll talk in more detail about what we've been doing with Team Steps in terms of students' education. But before the getting into how I came with Charles, I wanted to let everybody know that UF is fairly unique in terms of its very long and established history of interprofessional education. Our premier activity, and I'll provide some more details about it in a couple of slides, but our premier activity, interdisciplinary family health, or putting families first, actually began in 1999. And it um, involves our first year students. It's now required for the vast majority of our first year students. And they work in interprofessional teams with local families. And then about 2012, the uh, Health Science Center colleges decided to implement what we call interprofessional learning health care. This is targeted for second year students. And it's a couple sessions that follow a team-based learning format. And then we've got other interprofessional curricular and extracurricular activities that have been added, some maybe between specific colleges, simulation activities. And again, I, I reference the extracurricular activities. Now, you may be asking, how does all of this happen? So very, very briefly, our infrastructure is that we have a dedicated interprofessional education office. Uh, I, I'm the director, and I report directly to the senior vice president for research and education, who then reports to the vice president for health affairs here at the University of Florida, who oversees everything. So in a sense, Charles and I, our offices report to the same person. And I think that gives us a lot of leverage for integration and good reason to be working together. The office has an I, we work with what we call an IPE committee. It's been around for many, many years. Uh, the associate education deans of our six colleges are the members. And because our College of Public Health and Health Professions has several academic programs in it, there are some additional members from that. And it really is a very collaborative committee. I quote chair it, but we work very, very well together. We plan uh, interprofessional education activities. We evaluate what's going on. We're constantly looking and revising at the activities that we've had in place, that the uh, UF has had in place for so many years, and engage in strategic planning related to interprofessional education. I think another aspect of the UF Health Science Center that's unique was that uh, IP was a part <coughs> of the 2010-2015 strategic plan discussion in that around having a common curriculum, and then for the current strategic plan, 2015-2020, of which we're all part of that same plan Charles has referenced, but there is a specific reference to being a national model for interprofessional education. So there's been a long-standing commitment to IPE here at the University of Florida. Now, I said in my very introductory remarks, I've been in this field a little over 10 years, and I'm constantly learning about things. And I came to UF about three years ago. And one of the things I had worked on and learned at where I was working with previously was just this whole concept of, of where and how interprofessional education and teamwork go together. And I suspect several of you on the line are even more experts than I am in this field. But one of the things at my previous institution we were thinking about is that the whole development for students of their interprofessional collaborative competencies is really probably could be viewed along a developmental continuum. And I'm not going to go into detail about the visual here. If nothing else, I thought it might be a little pretty. It has some, some color to it. But it's meant to visually kind of represent that developmental continuum that students we know are following in their own programs of study and training, and that perhaps we should think about them developing these interprofessional collaborative competencies and teamwork skills along a similar line, so that they sort of have some basic introduction, probably in classroom, kind of protected settings. But then as they progress in their study, they're using more advanced skills, and that they're applying these in kind of unbounded, um, more complicated settings, such as clinics and communities. And so the spiral is actually meant to represent a learning spiral of phases of acquisition, application, demonstration, and not for those of us on the uh, Atlantic where we're thinking about hurricanes, 
not <laughs> right this week, I think, or those of us um, who live in other parts of the country where tornadoes, again, this is the learning spiral. But I, I reference this, again, because my own thinking and, and thinking I've shared with colleagues here, and for better or worse, they've kind of bought into it, is that teamwork is something to think about along a developmental continuum. And therefore, what concepts do you want to introduce to learners when? And when I, I came to UF, as I said three years ago, a long history of interprofessional education and a little bit of reference to teamwork in it, but not a real explicit reference. And I began to talk with our IP committee members about, hmm, maybe we should begin to pay some more explicit attention to this. I know that Team Steps is being introduced to a lot of interprofessional education programs, and honestly didn't want our learners to kind of be left behind when they graduate and perhaps go into residency or into employment settings where Team Steps is referenced and they'd be like, hmm, I'm not quite sure what this is about. And the IPE committee members um, sort of recognized that with me. And uh, they decided to appoint an ad hoc committee faculty to begin to think about how we could implement this. And as I've said, I've sort of gently pushed and people accepted the concept of Team Steps. It was also handy to say, like, well, their materials are for free out on the web. We can download, use them as we want to. I and a colleague in the office, Dr. Eric Black, we'd actually been using Team Steps out at a nurse managed uh, clinic that we've been doing some research with, so we had some familiarity with it. But what was, I think, real key to getting to the point of meeting up with Charles was that the faculty in this ad hoc group said, you know, we'd, we'd kind of like to have some training. If we're going to be responsible for developing curricula within our own program and across programs, we, we'd really like to have some more in-depth training. And so Timing is everything, I think, a lot of times. And it was about this time that uh, Dr. Eduardo Salas, who you may recognize, worked with D Dr. David Baker and other scientists to develop Team Steps. He was here at the College of Medicine to give a talk for the College of Medicine's Education Week. And of course, I wanted an opportunity. I'd been working with Ed on some things. And talked to him about you know, Team Steps. And he suggested, well, maybe bring some master trainers to campus. Certainly, we could try to send a few faculty to a, to a training, you know, to one of the Team Step sites, but to consider that. And I, I thought, hmm, that's a good idea. I could probably round up 15 to 20 people for a master training session. We can find some master trainers. And then I thought to myself, hmm, I'm always talking about how important it is for students to have role models and see during their clinical rotations effective teamwork. And I know some of that's going on here at UF. But I'm thinking I kind of knew a little bit about the hospital side of life. Maybe there's an opportunity that they'd want to think about doing more related to team steps. And that's where I connected with, I guess, the chief quality officer, yep. um, Charles's direct boss, and kind of said, hmm, would there be any interest in partnering? That's about the time they had come back, Charles and Dr. Baron Lee and some other folks had come back from Denver, and we're excited about it. And it really was about this time last year, I think in August, we met and we said, let's do this. And that's how the invitation, and somehow Charles made the connection with Dr. David Baker yep. and Dr. Crane. And the rest you've already heard. They came in October, or we had the webinar in October, yep. and then in December they came and did the master training. And again, I was able to have faculty from um, most of our colleges attend that master training for them to become familiar with it. And we've had other faculty on quote, the more academic side, attend the master trainings with the idea that they would then be bringing these concepts into their own curricula. So uh, that's, again, part of the story of how Charles and I have connected. And we've been having a great time working together with mm -hmm. each other. I'm going to switch gears a little bit to talk about how we've been implementing this into the student's academic life. And I had referenced at the very beginning our program, which we're calling Putting Families First, that it's been around for a long time. And our ad hoc faculty group recognized that this, this really is a huge ship and that would be very difficult to make dramatic changes with because uh, it's, a well, it's, a, it's a wonderful experience for students. And just very briefly here, a few more details. We have students, four students in an interprofessional team. They are assigned to a local family. They need to do four home visits with that family and work on a health improvement project for the family that could be related directly to health, such as improving exercise or diet, or projects maybe on a broader scale, such as completing financial aid application forms for a child going off to college. 
we had a group this past year actually get donations and uh, poured a concrete sidewalk for a woman who could, in, in her electric wheelchair, more easily go from front door to car in order to get to work. So we, we define that very broadly. And then our students also participate in, small, in six small group sessions with an interprofessional faculty team where they're debriefing their home visits and also discussing other content. We view this as a service learning and interprofessional service learning experience. And we've known that there have been some teamwork challenges, particularly when we had the small group size for students go from three students to a team to four students to a team to include our vet med students and health administration students two years ago. And I've got on here, some of these challenges are scheduling the home visits. We require that all students be together for the home visits. And of course, as a team, they need to determine what the project focus is, design and implement that project, and then create a project presentation. So we're thinking about how we could introduce Team Steps concepts into this. This is not a clinical kind of learning experience for students, but clearly we're having them apply, learn and apply teamwork skills. And we've had the feeling for, for several years, and it's my own thinking, I'm not sure the students who come into our health professions programs have had a lot of experience with real teamwork and instruction and effective teamwork. So one of the things that we did last year, and I realize this slide is it, it's, it's small in terms of its print, but it's really meant more to illustrate, was one of our ad hoc faculty had found a, a chapter in a book, Ed, Eduardo Salas was the primary author on this, talking about teamwork, and it had this wonderful chart where it has teamwork concepts, and these, again, are underlying or they're outcomes related to team steps, provides a definition of that concept, and then it provides a behavioral example. So that's wonderful. And we thought, this is great, but for our students in IFH, maybe we should provide them some specific behavioral examples for this learning activity. And so we took the chart, and we we put that column in. And again, recognizing it maybe a little, probably is a little hard for folks to read. Just a couple of examples. Uh, for example, around um, team leadership, there's supposed to be a student team leader for each meeting. And so that's the person who's responsible for setting the time to meet with the family and making sure that works for all of the other students, keeping the team on track during the visit and project work. When we come to mutual support or backup behavior, again, making sure everybody's participating. Um, recognizing when maybe they need to con the group need to contact the office because they need some additional assistance in terms of the project or have a concern about the family. Um, this is the second page of this is actually a three-page document. When it comes to adaptability, the need perhaps to accommodate patient and team schedule for visit and not be so focused on one's own study schedule for an exam. A uh, shared mental model, we also emphasize with the idea in IFH that everyone understands what the goal is with the patient, what that health improvement project is going to be. So what we did last year with PFF, and we'll be continuing it this year, is we provided students this document and some additional information. And then because all of the work is done in these small groups, we had case discussions throughout the years that highlighted these specific teamwork skills or examples of these teamwork skills so that students and faculty could talk about these during their small group discussions. We then also, when the students do a home visit report, and again, they have four of these they have to do, we ask them explicitly to describe teamwork skills used, again, referencing back to these that we had outlined. And then this was also true for their final group project, that they needed to describe, after the description of the project, teamwork skills that they used. We have students in the experience do a peer assessment of each other's teamwork skills, Sometimes I feel like we're kind of overkilling it, but I think it's important, multiple reinforcement here of learning about these teamwork concepts. And with that peer assessment, we also require students to do a brief reflection on what their results were based on that. What do they want to stop doing? What do they want to start doing? And what do they want to continue doing? We've actually been looking at the data from the peer assessment from last year versus the year before when we did nothing explicit around teamwork, and we're actually seeing some interesting we think improvement. We're, we're still looking through the data, but we're, we're seeing that perhaps it's actually made a real difference. Uh, the upcoming academic year starts for us pretty soon, in a month or so. Um, we're going to be more explicit that this is coming from Team Steps. 
We didn't include much about conflict resolution, so we're going to be adding that to our chart. And we're going to be using some fun video clips to highlight the concepts and sending those out to students and making them available on the course website. So again, with this course, the service learning, interprofessional service learning course, we've been introducing a lot of the team steps concepts. We also are going to be doing this, or, and we know we've been having this done, in other learning. And the idea is that the team steps are going to be done where it's relevant for students in their individual academic programs as well as in these interprofessional offerings. And we've been looking at when student teams work together. We know, for example, in the dental school that they have a lot of group and uh, teamwork. The dental school will be emphasizing this. Our pharmacy school does a lot of instruction around team-based learning. They've been using this. One of the faculty who was participated in the master training in December already, already implemented in her introduction to community pharmacy concepts around SBAR and, and CUS for those particular students. Uh, we're asking students in clinical settings. We've got a faculty member who's running the anesthesia critical care clerkship to be doing some reflective observation of teamwork skills in those settings, as well as in a first year preceptorship. Of course, there are opportunities. We're building out some simulation activities. And then um, there's also learning in extracurricular or co-curricular activities. I had the pleasure last week, we have our OT and PT students are starting to run an <coughs> interprofessional clinic for the underserved here in the Gainesville area. And due to the fact that some of the faculty uh, from OT, from occupational therapy and physical therapy, had attended the master training, they asked me to come and do an introductory session around team steps in the communication module for these students in the student-run clinic last week. And we'll be doing additional team steps training with the students as they move forward with their work. So you can begin to think about how to introduce team steps. And I'm sure many of you have already started doing it in your co-curricular activities as well. The big academic goal, and again, this is a sort of an illustration of, of, a, of the picture. It's a grid where we've got on the one side the, the big picture uh, concepts around team steps and then the specific tools. And the idea is then to have a curriculum map of where these are in our interprofessional education activities, as well as then across the separate academic programs. And we'll be fleshing this out during the upcoming year, then figuring out where we need to begin to reinforce. The idea being that introduced where educationally relevant, and going back to that thought that this needs to be where developmentally appropriate, and also then to provide multiple learning opportunities so that students have the opportunity to practice their skills and, again, to refine them over time. So I think I'm going to pass the baton to Charles for our final yeah. thoughts, but I've given you a, a little picture of what we've been doing on the academic side. So just to bring it all home for you, uh, this is another slide that's not on the template, but this is a slide I put into most of the presentations to, uh, is, is we're aware here of obviously of our strategic plan, and I brought it up uh, within this, because it's, uh, it, it's our blueprint, uh, that, and a lot of time and effort goes into it. So I usually put this in in the sense of, I might change the pictures, but to, we, you know, we have to identify that, um, that our strategic plan is all about high reliability and the highlights for communication and teamwork. UF Health, we talked about we're so blessed to have all these colleges and an academic medical center in one spot. We need to acknowledge that because I don't know that we, we, we always leverage it as well as we probably could. Um, and it's all about enhancing communication. We do reference a teamwork system, data management and technology and, and leveraging those, development and integration of the academic programs across the Health Science Center. Obviously, we, we're looking at optimizing the operations, the quality and the growth. We, even though we are bringing up two new towers, we never lose track of the fact that we're working within fixed assets and we're always working on uh, those workflows and optimizing them, uh, you know, with length of stay and maintaining quality. Um, with the collaboration across the University of Florida overall, the greater university and industry partnerships, partnering with our community, and, you know, the overall mitigating the effects of countervailing forces, whatever those may be. So the more reliable our processes, we can better handle and be more resilient as, you know, the healthcare system and the world is ever changing with us. But the, 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 big, the big win in all of this is in our strategic plan, the, the primary goal overall is to become that leading learning health system that optimizes all of these resources uh, of the practitioners and their trainers and everything else to uh, 
to, to a primary function of healing, our secondary function of teaching, and then the, the, the discovery, the, our research components. So um, on that note, uh, we'll kind of wrap it up, and hopefully we've showed you uh, where we're trying to meet our blueprint for success with our, uh, with our organization on our uh, building up of team steps here. And we'll turn it over. I think now it's... it's for questions. Okay. Yeah. Great. Thank you, guys. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation and for, for showing us all the things that are going on at your institution. It seems like you've come a long way uh, in a short period of time, uh, even though you had those foundations. And so it was, it was great. And, and Charles, that Dancing Guy video, I really do love that one. That <laughs> one is... Fantastic. Actually, earlier today I got a text from some people that are out in the field attending a training and they were seeing the video for the first time and said, hey, we saw that Dancing Guy video. We love it. So it's been really a, a part of my day, it seems like. <laughs> it, it's very powerful. I mean, you know, the, the visual is one thing, but the, the concepts are absolutely powerful. Yeah, and I know that Jen uh, included in the text box, uh, text area, a link for that video. So for folks that haven't seen it, go grab that link and check it out when we're done here because it's a good one and, and it's funny. It really is. So I, I love I love the first few followers. Those guys always crack me up. <laughs> All right. So a um, lot of questions. Uh, first, I've got one for Charles because it comes back from when you were speaking originally. And people are just curious about how you go about and keep the enthusiasm and engagement of master trainers once they've completed the training? Uh, uh, that, that is, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry, yeah. that is an excellent question. I, I will say um, the ultimate end that I'm just about to achieve now is a great spot on our intranet website to pull a lot of this uh, stuff together and be able to push stuff out to them. But I did allude to the redosing in, in venues. Um, I do see uh, some of these people regularly and just uh, some level of communication. It has been seven months, so I, I can't say I've reached the pinnacle of where I want to be with that, but you're absolutely right. But they do know, they see the progress in uh, uh, just different things we do when we, when we communicate back. Just uh, For instance, now I'm going to roll out to send more master trainers for our next program. So where I want to be, and with two graduate interns, finally I can achieve final building of this website here, where uh, we can we can li have them linked constantly in both. I'm looking at two basic groups, uh, maybe a coach and master trainer group, where we link in with our, our faculty and the master trainers across the organization, and then perhaps a user level group for those as we just start our fundamentals classes. So I'm not got that per excuse me totally nailed yet, but that'll be the place. It, the way it works for us, we can push stuff out automatically and also set up a library for them and then link to the. Uh, resources outside. So it's a very important thing to do because in some ways there's a dormancy there between that class and then the next tap on the shoulder is when we start rolling out somewhere. So thank yeah. you for that. Oh, right. yeah. it, what's also helpful, and it's a small number of people, but it's been helpful on the academic side where they've got both roles because those have been some of our key champions on the academic side of thinking about how to build this out into, the, into their own curricula and or within our interprofessional offerings. Okay. So that's, that's good. So a question then for you, Amy, um, talking about, uh, so we have more than a few people ask when it comes to the actual education side of things, what you would do if, if you were in a situation where you didn't have uh, interdisciplinary possibilities, the schools weren't close together, or maybe you just had a nursing school, like some locations have, and then they don't have a med school that's connected to them, or, or pharmacy, or any of those other types of schools. So how would you go about doing a program that way? Right. And again, I think um, my own thinking would be within those programs to think, first of all, what's going to be relevant for where their learners are in their own training. Uh -huh. Um, having worked in medical schools for several years, it's easiest for me to go back to that model where your first year medical student, they're, they're not really doing a whole lot clinically. And that's actually true for a lot of the other health professions, not all of them. And so that's why sort of going to broader concepts, and that's kind of what we're trying to do in IFH, things around a shared mental model. 
talking about SBAR might not quite make so sense, but that's going to be perfectly relevant for when a student is starting clinical rotations uh, and, you know, as they progress into their own training. So my thought there is, again, thinking about what makes sense developmentally and what the students are doing with respect to their education. You know, you don't necessarily have to do this in terms of an interprofessional approach. We've just been very fortunate here at UF, and to me it makes sense then, again, to partner with the healthcare system because a lot of the care is being delivered by multiple professions. Right. Okay. So what kind of advice, and this is really for both of you, would you give somebody who's coming, who maybe comes through either your education system or maybe is working at UF and, and is, you know, really becoming comfortable team stuff. So either they've learned it in the education system or they're just using it professionally and then they, they go out and maybe they get a job somewhere else that's not using this. How do they, how do you translate this or how do you, what, what should their first steps be in maybe making this work where they're going? The underlying concepts, I think, would translate uh, anywhere, and, and, and I think what we're trying to do is link the training with the initiative here. In other words, we have so many things going, but we don't have team steps, is uh, linking it with what you're already doing and how it fits. So <laughs> most hospitals, I think, around the, at least around this country, are probably working on mostly the same things with the, the, the level of, you know, we're all linked with various regulations and national standards. So. I think that, that would be it, but we have had that conversation uh, here uh, because one of the things Dr. Blue definitely wants is that her graduates do see it when they come into the hospital. Right. So I will tell yeah. you that we do bring that up at meetings, and it's, it's actually a mover and a shaker in a meeting after people are listening, okay, what does Charles want now? It's like, oh, and by the way, these graduates will be coming out starting next year. And then every year after that, with each school as they come up line, actually that has motivated uh, a lot of our folks because we're like, it's almost like having a guess. Oh, they're really coming. We got to get ready. You know what I mean? That's right. you, got, you got me now. You know, so yeah. It, no, Charles is right, and he always reminds me. Or sometimes, and I'll be up front in our master training. You know, why why would somebody from a, a college of public health and an IP office have an interest in this? Because again, I know our students are going to be going into these clinical rotations. We want them to be seeing effective teamwork and be change agents themselves. Exactly. Set the standard. That's what they, when they leave here that they, we're trying to give them theoretically the best that we can for them yeah. to go and seed it elsewhere. That's, I mean, you guys are doing great work with that because I know that that's something that in talking with people in the past who are educators, they're worried, you know, oh, we're going to go through and we're going to teach everybody this, but are they going to get eaten alive when they leave? And it's, it's even people who do it in orientation at hospitals. They, they're like, okay, we're, we're doing this for our new employees, but gosh, are people really using it on the floor? Are people going to remember their orientation? And so it's great to hear that you guys are, are really trying to set that foundation and, and keep it moving. <laughs> mm -hmm. Good, good. Um, Amy, another question for, I, for you, I think, um, or maybe this is for both of you guys, actually. How did you decide upon your master trainers, be the, you know, from whatever profession they're from? What made somebody a good candidate? Strong interest. Yeah. I'll, I'll be perfectly yeah. honest. Uh -huh. um, it really was, you know, I sort of let our ad hoc faculty group know they already had a strong interest and they've been involved. They've been involved in interprofessional education, so they sort of had an appreciation for the importance of teamwork. Um, I think also being educators um, in terms of becoming master trainers, that, that they would naturally gravitate toward that in terms of interest and ability. So it's really been that. And then as we've done subsequent master trainings, and I know as we'll go out and do fundamentals, it really will be more like for folks to be familiar with, with the content and the concept. So if they want to adapt these things into their own courses, they can do so. And I absolutely echo that. One of the advantages, as, you, as we look back in October, you know, we teed this up even before Dr. Baker and Dr. Crane came. It was sort of a coming out party um, with yeah. Team Steps. And then we had two months in an interim where we would hear from people and absolutely the interest. And then we, we I'll speak on our side, but I have a lot of entrance with people. Like I've worked with people for years here. I've been here about eight years. So, you know, you just know those people. A lot of the times the same people that are very interested in new things that have a lot of influence 
And so it was also trying to get it as broad as we could and, uh, uh, and everything. And some people for that first class in particular, we had to turn several away just for the next class that we were going to have because we, did, we, kind of, we kind of split it up because we definitely wanted the faculty to have about half those positions because, again, the shorter turnaround and everything. But uh, uh, it, so exactly um, exact, teeing it up and then uh, people contacted us, uh, and they still do. So, it's, uh, again, it's, uh, it's broad. It's sporadic still, but it's broad. So, again, <laughs> in our world, I, I really feel strongly, once they see the neurosurgeons and the neurology crowd uh, putting the pedal to the metal, I think that's really going to get people going in their own. And we'll, we'll be having the fundamentals classes to back that up. Yeah. yeah and your, your question has had me think is we're more explicit in our um, Putting Families First program this year saying these are team steps concepts and the faculty are going to be seeing that. I suspect we'll have more faculty coming mm -hmm. to us and wanting to learn more. We have mm -hmm. about 90 to 100 faculty who work with these small groups. I, I realize I neglected to say this is an experience for 700 students. So we've got 45 different small groups, as I already just said, 90, 95, 100 faculty involved. So it touches a lot of students here. That's great. I, I think we have time for one more question. Um, uh, a couple people were interested in, in what the results have been with the Putting Families First initiative, and then also how did you identify the families? Okay, so the results of that, um, I'd like to say we've got a lot of elegant outcome data, and, and that's kind of murky in terms of, of the history of that program. Um, we've actually done some qualitative kind of why, fam why people are interested in volunteering, and of course they like to have the access to resources, and a lot of it's also just companionship and support from the students. Uh, we've started now, since we've implemented a more robust system around students' teamwork skills, as I mentioned earlier, we're beginning to look at that. Uh, how do we recruit families? Well, one thing that was unique to our office is we've had a full-time social worker slash case manager and an educator, and it's really kind of going out into the community and working with community organizations. Our families do span the socioeconomic spectrum, so we do have people who uh, are on the lower end of that spectrum, and we also do have some people on the higher end of that spectrum. And we figure that this is also learning for students uh, in their groups, their small groups debriefing sessions. We make sure that there are student teams working with different types of families so that they're hearing about the various challenges. That sounds great. Well, I, for one, am really interested in, in hearing more from you guys in the future as things go on, as you get to these fundamentals courses, and I'm sure everyone else will be as well. So, you know, maybe there's a presentation at the Team Steps National Conference next year or something so we could hear more about your results as time goes on. Sure. Yeah, that'd be great. That'd be, that'd be great. Well, thank you very much for joining us today and thanks to everybody that listened and sent in questions. We have uh, any questions that we didn't get to, we'll make sure to, to grab off of the chat board and and shoot over to you guys so that uh, everybody gets their questions answered. Thank you so very well, much for yes, having us. Say, we really appreciated the opportunity to, to share our story. It gave us some pause for thought, too, yes. and think about yes. ways moving forward. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. It's been an exciting year. <clears throat>